Hey all and welcome to a, another video for the Legal Studies Guy. Uh, today we are up to 3.1.4 um, looking at the rights of victims in a criminal case. Uh, quick quote today from William Longwood, no idea who he is or uh, what he does, but he said this cool thing once, uh, dreams and dedication are a powerful combination. That's the idea of, hey, set some lofty goals for this year in year 12, and then particularly it's no good just having goals. You've got to set yourself goals, but then actually um, set yourself or plan out some actions that you'll take to achieve those goals. Um, so what are you actually going to do rather than just being like, oh, here's this thing I want. Well, what are you actually going to do? What steps are you going to take to get there? And that's the idea of combining dreams and then dedication, actually following through on the actions. Um, and that's where you'll get uh, or how you'll get to where you need to be. Uh, so 314 today, um, our essential question is going to be, what rights does a victim have um, during criminal proceedings? Uh, and just like the rights of the accused, um, we are broadly told that we need to know the rights of victims, but then given three specific rights that we need to learn about. So the right to give evidence using alternative arrangements, the right to be informed about the proceedings and the right to be informed of the likely release date of the offender. Um, similar to the rights of the accused, because these three are explicitly in the study design, it's there's nothing to say that you couldn't be asked a specific question about them on the exam. Um, so you need to learn all three. It's not a case of like, oh, I'll just try and remember one of the rights. Um, you've got to be across all three of these. And again, our key skill is just going to be explain. Um, and we'll look at a bit of a simpler task word, a very rare one today, but um, but one that is worth knowing. So like rights of an accused, three rights of victims that we need to learn about. Um, victim obviously have more rights than this, um, but these are the three that are dictated by the study design for us. So the right to give evidence using alternative arrangements. Um, and this is the idea of just, yeah, the ability to give evidence through or in a way that's not traditional. Obviously, our justice system is very, um, yeah, very old fashioned in a lot of ways. Um, really strict rules that have been honed over centuries of um, of hearing cases. Um, obviously, right back into um, you know more or less medieval Britain. Um, and a big feature of that is the idea that every witness has to um, go onto the stand. Um, answer questions they can't stray from the questions that they're asked uh, and then those witnesses have to be cross-examined um, and we know that this process can be really really traumatizing for victims um, this traditional process so we're going to learn about ways to make victims feel more comfortable when they're giving evidence um, particularly as if an accused person is self-represented um, they might be the ones asking the question which can you know, be really traumatic uh, be informed about proceedings, so a really big access one. Um, and this is, you know, through the Victims Charter, it, it's really, um, it is mandated that if you're a victim of crime and you make um, a report to police and subsequently followed up and, and say charges are laid, that um, the police and the prosecution must then keep you in the loop about what's going on. And finally, uh, to be informed of the likely release date of the offender. So let's say that, you are a victim of crime and you're involved in the process and then you gain a conviction or that person is convicted um, by the court, um, prosecution gains that conviction, you have the ability to then still keep track of that offender once they are in prison, if that's where they go, um, just in terms of closure for yourself, but also being prepared because we don't send a lot of people to prison for life um, and, you know, they're going to get out at some point, particularly if you're from small towns or things like that. Um, it can be nice to know when that's happening so you can make preparations um, for that, what can be obviously a traumatic situation. Um, this stuff all comes from the Victorian's victim, Victorian Victims Charter. Um, you can easily look this up and have a look through and I'll link you later on with a basically a full website um, that's dedicated to victims of crime and the information that they can get from that. Uh, Victoria has basically yeah, has taken this from some international um, agreements around this stuff. So the United Nations Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice for Victims of Crime and Abuse of Power. Um, very wordy, and we've just uh, turned it into a victim's charter um, that details all these things. So 
let's get into these three in a little bit more detail. So evidence using alternative arrangements. And you can see here from the picture, I've got a common setup for what alternative arrangements might be, and that's giving evidence from another location. So usually in the court building, but from a different room so that you're not in the same vicinity as the person that is alleged to have, um, in these instances, committed some kind of violent um, or power-based crime against you. Um, really, really important that we understand this. Giving evidence in a trial is um, a really rigid process. Like I said, it's really old-fashioned. One of the really key features of, the, of it is that you not only um, hear or the jury not only hears the answers the witnesses give, but the jury gets to analyse the witness, analyse their body language, how they respond to questions. Um, anytime you see a courtroom, if you ever get to go and see one, and we've got the judge sitting up the front here, just there, um, you'll have your bar tables, which will have your lawyers on it. This is a really, really basic, um, basic diagram, obviously. But if you've got your jury box over here, every courtroom might be on different sides, but often this side. The jury box will be here, and they'll be the same side as the prosecution. The witness stand will be directly opposite them. So your witnesses will be over there. And the whole idea is the jury has to sit opposite the witness so that as the witness is questioned and then cross-examined, that the jury can observe more than just the words that they say. They can observe the body language, the facial expressions. Um, you know, do they become upset, exasperated, angry? All of these things then weigh into the jury deciding whether that witness is um, believable or not, credible or not, how much weight they give to that evidence. So... Changing that, the idea of allowing someone to not be in the courtroom to give evidence from another location is a really, really big deal in the justice system. And that's why, and this is the important point, evidence using alternative arrangements is really, really limited for victims. It is only for victims in criminal matters relating to sexual offences, family violence, or... We don't really need to worry about this obscene behaviour in the Summary Offences Act, which is effectively um, exposure, you know, um, being a victim of, yeah, a public exposure event where someone, you know, exposes their genitalia, etc. Um, but these are the two big ones that we want to focus on, sexual offences or family violence. So if you are a witness in a sexual offence or a family violence offence, you have access to this. But we want to go even a little bit further. We are talking about not just witnesses. We are talking about direct victims. So if you are the complainant, aka if you are the direct victim in a sexual offence or a family violence matter, you automatically get to give evidence using alternative arrangements. What does that look like? Well, like this image shows, First and foremost, it's not going into the courtroom. It's giving your evidence via CCTV. Secondly, if you... So, as I said, this is automatic, which means you have to... Basically, the victim gets to do this unless they ask to go into the courtroom. So, the victim and the prosecution applies on their behalf. The victim is the only one who can be like, no, I don't want to use CCTV. I want to go into the courtroom. Well, if the victim goes into the courtroom, then they automatically get to give evidence with a screen around them so they don't have to see the accused person unless they ask to not have that. And if they ask to not have that, so if they say, hey, I don't want to do CCTV, I don't want to do the screen, I want to be in the courtroom, I want to see the person, then they automatically get to have a support person with them unless they apply to not have that. So what we're getting at is evidence using alternative arrangements is locked in for victims of sexual offences and family violence, and it will start with giving evidence via CCTV, but could also include being in the courtroom with a screen in front of them, having a support person, uh, closing the court to the public. Um, they might even make legal practitioners de-robe, so take off their, their formal robes. Um, if you are under 18 or have a cognitive impairment, so over 18 but a cognitive impairment, there are also some extra things that can apply for you, um, particularly giving evidence um, 
pre-recorded. So not having to actually be questioned and cross-examined at all um, or, or not in the same way as a traditional trial. But again, focusing on who can give evidence using alternative arrangements where we're focused on victims in sexual offences and family violence matters. Um, and this is just a little snippet from the Criminal Procedure Act, which details what those arrangements are, and it just lists these things again. So um, from a place other than the courtroom, using closed-circuit television, screens, um, having a sore poor person, et cetera, et cetera. It's so worthwhile having a read of that, and you can easily look this up online. Uh, our second right, informed of proceedings. Um the language of uh, the victim's charter is that a victim must be informed at reasonable intervals. So it doesn't sort of define it, a bit like, you know, trial without unreasonable delay for an accused person. Um, but the idea being that there is an expectation that the Office of Public Prosecutions or the police prosecutor, if it's a summary matter and the, um, the OPP is not dealing with it, uh, is that they keep you in the loop as a victim. Um, so a range of things that they must inform you about, for example, um, if they decide to file a charge, so if they actually be like, yes, we're filing a charge, they should let you know. If they decide to modify or drop charges, they should let you know. Uh, if they're entering into plea negotiations, um, they're not required to, but they should let you know. If you want to be in, you want to know about when court hearings are happening or particularly the trial, they should let you know or show you how to find out so that you can turn up if you want to be, um, if you yeah, want to be involved or you want to know what's going on. And obviously they should inform you of the ultimate outcome in the end. Um, and this is also a big one. I mean, um, rights of victims, um, if I guess a charge is not filed or it's discontinued, then technically under the, um, legal system, you're not a victim anymore because no one's been um, convicted. But if prosecution or police decide not to charge someone or to discontinue charges, they need to explain to you why. So the whole idea, again, is just keeping you in the loop um, in terms of hopefully dealing with perhaps some of the stress that people might feel um, as they're trying to get their justice as a victim. And finally, the likely release date of the offender. So this is literally just as it says. Um, you can find out a range of things, such as uh, length of sentence if the person applies for parole, so applies to be released. Um, if they get released, what their parole conditions are. Um, you'll be informed if they die in prison or if they escape from prison. Effectively, you just get regular updates on certain things while they're in prison, particularly the big one, you're updated if they're released. The whole purpose is you don't want to run into the person that has, say, been in jail for the last eight years for committing a violent, it's only for victims of violent crime. Um, you don't want to run into them after eight years and be like, had no idea that you were out of prison. That can be really, really re-traumatizing for people. Um, the idea is that they need to prepare, they need to know um, before that sort of thing happens. Um, you also can, um, if you are on the victim's register, which you have to apply to be on as a victim of violent crime and you're told these things, you can actually also take or participate in um their parole process. If they are applying for early release, you can actually make submissions um, asking for them not to be. Uh, so our key skill, again, is explain the rights of an accused and of victims. But I just want to do this like really straightforward question. We don't really get any identifiers um, anymore. We haven't had them on, on an exam since 2018, but with a new study design, you never know. Um, and I really want to make this clear. If you see an identification question, all you need to do is make a statement. You do not need to provide any extra detail. So identify two rights of victims in the Victorian criminal justice system. You just need to state two. You just need to name them and do nothing more. So an answer could look as simple as this. Two rights held by victims in the criminal justice system are the right to be informed of proceedings and the right to be informed of the likely release date of the offender. 
So if you ever see an identify question, literally just punch out and name the bit of content that you need to name and move on. Don't waste your time doing any explanations. Um, evaluation principles of justice. Um, nearly there, our next videos on those. Um, so you can brush up on them since year 11 if you did them there. Um, but have a think about what we talked about just then. And this is how they achieve and don't achieve. Lots in here. Um, brush through it pretty quick. Uh, fairness with evidence using alternative arrangements because it gets that evidence into the courtroom. If the victim wasn't going to be able to and these arrangements help them to, that means we get all of the evidence laid out in front of the jury and then the jury can make a decision based off that. We're going to get the right outcome or the just outcome. However, what perception might that give to a jury? Hey, you can't even be in the same room as this person. Well, they probably did it, didn't they? And all of a sudden, the jury might start thinking with a little bit of bias or prejudice towards the accused person. So you have to be really like, we have to be careful with when we allow these arrangements to be used um, because there could be some unintended consequences. Um, also, a lot of what we talked about with being formed of proceedings, um, and these are these points here, is the idea that we're, you know, just giving the victim information, but ultimately they're not involved. They don't. They're not an active participant in um, the criminal conviction of or or prosecution of the person that is alleged to have harmed them. They're just a tool, really, that we use to prove the facts. Hey, get in there, give your evidence, great, move on. Um, you're just a sort of a pawn in the process. When realistically, a victim is someone who's been traumatised and we need to be looking at ways to make, and this is a lot of the 2023 legal studies exam, one of the case studies um, in a VLRC project. Um, we need to be looking at ways to maybe make victims feel uh, yeah, like they're more involved rather than just being given a bunch of information. Um, and this can be seen as unjust for a victim. Um, rights of victims are applied equally um, to all victims of crime who are eligible. So there's a bit of equality there. People charged with the similar or same offences get the same rights, so on and so forth. Um, however, things like, you know, likely release date only available to some victims. You need to apply. Um, so people who have similar offences, some might apply, some might not, you know, creates that little bit of inequality, you know, people getting different outcomes and different factors that could weigh into that. Uh, informed about proceedings is all about access um, and even likely release date of the offender can sort of come into there as well. It's all about giving you information, allowing you to engage um, with the justice system. Um, but again, are you truly engaging if you're not an active participant? If you're just a tool used to get a conviction, you're just someone being given a heap of information about what's going on, but you're not actually getting a say. You're not actually having any input. And as a result, you're not necessarily um, yeah, getting the benefits that you're hoping to as a victim. So that's one to think about. Uh, and ultimately just thinking about this as well, you know, is there a bit of a tug of war between rights of victims and rights of the accused? Um, if we give victims too many rights, allow them to participate too much and too many alternative arrangements, et cetera, et cetera, at what point are we jeopardising the idea of a fair trial? At what point are we jeopardising um, the structures and processes that have worked in our, well, some people would say they haven't worked, um, but have, you know, been a key pillar of our justice system for hundreds of years. Um, really sort of big, broader and deeper questions there than perhaps we need to consider in legal studies. Uh, I'll include this link below, um, just a website that the Victorian government has that is fully dedicated to um, victims of crime. So if you have been a victim of crime um, or you're interested to see what sort of information they can get, have a click on that and have a look. Um, yeah, look, hopefully no one ever asks you this question um, because hopefully you avoid this sort of stuff in your life. But if someone does say to you, hey, I've been the victim of a crime, what rights do I have? I would hope that after watching that, you can give them a really, really comprehensive answer. Um, feel free to jump into the comments. Um, yeah, let us know how we're going. Let us know how you're going. 
um, anything else you would like us to do in our videos. Um, but thanks for watching the whole way through.